Hello and welcome to another Market Muse content strategy webinar. And today's guest is amazing and I'm so excited to introduce him after I get through some housekeeping. But the name of our session today is gonna be Seven Steps to Small Business Marketing Success. And we'll be focusing on small to medium businesses, how to get more budget, how to get more results with less resources. Um, but first, like I mentioned, a little bit of housekeeping. If you haven't been on the sessions before or haven't been on since we transitioned to On24, which is an amazing platform uh, for webinars like this one, um, ask us anything. We're going to be talking about specifically small and medium business. But if you've got any questions, you know, our guest has written uh, books, as we'll talk about, about almost everything, every part of the journey, every part of online marketing, every part of marketing in general. Um, so please ask us anything and we'll get to them in line if they're directly relevant to our discussion. Um, or we're going to be having an Ask Me Anything session in the Market Muse Content Strategy Collective Slack channel. So we're going to put the bit.ly link up very shortly. Go sign up for that if you're not already, but get your questions ready, fire them in here. If we don't get to them, uh, like I mentioned, we're going to get them at the end in a question and answer, and then we'll fire them at our guest in the AMA, which is always super fun. Um, another thing, we're going to have this recording ready in the next few days, and we'll shoot it to you if you're signed up for this webinar. Feel free to share it. Uh, feel free to fire it away in your social media channels. Um, but while you're at it, we have almost 100 recordings of content strategy uh, webinars with people like Kevin Indig, uh, Andy Crestadina, uh, Pam Didner on sales enablement, um, Jason Barnard on brand SERPs. I mean, just really a treasure trove, building out you know, a content strategy crash course for anyone just starting out or even a veteran. All right, cool. So that's my fun housekeeping part. Now I'm going to make this intro. Um, my guest is a marketing consultant, speaker, and author of Duct Tape Marketing. He wrote The Referral Engine, The Self-Reliant Entrepreneur, and The Ultimate Marketing Engine. He's also the founder of Duct Tape Marketing Consultant Network, which trains and licenses independent consultants and agencies to use the duct tape methodology. You probably know who I'm talking about, but welcome, John Jantz. Oh, I can't hear you. Yeah, that's better. Uh, so, <laughs> so happy to be here today as well. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me. I uh, love to talk about all things marketing. Oh, awesome! And so great to have you. And I mentioned a few of the things that you're working on, but what's your most exciting thing that you're working on right now that may launch coming up? And then, can you tell everyone a little bit more yeah. about um, the duct tape methodology and the duct tape sure. uh, network? So, you, 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 you bet. So, I'd be remiss, or at least my publisher would call me remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to talk about the, the ultimate marketing uh, engine, which is actually not due out until September of 2021, depending upon when, if you're tuning into the archive, uh, uh, but uh, it's available for pre-order now. Uh, but the thing I'm probably um, the most jazzed about just because of the feedback and response is that, you know, we, I have worked with, and as you mentioned, have a network of consultants who have worked with small business owners uh, for years and in, in installing, as we say, at the duct tape marketing system. And a lot of that's kind of done for you. Uh, it's, you know, we develop a strategy and then we work with them to, to implement that strategy. But <laughs> I have seen over the years where a lot of small businesses, mid-sized businesses, frankly, have, 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 you know, grown to a certain level, but don't have any internal marketing assets or resources. Certainly uh, have not gotten to the point where they've made a strategic marketing hire in a lot of cases. Um, and part of that's because they, they really don't have a sense of you know, what to tell that person to do or how to manage that team or how to how to know if it's a, an effective approach. And so we've created a, a new certification that we're calling the Certified Marketing Manager. And so a lot of what we're doing now is in addition to developing strategy and, and you know, kind of being the outsourced CMO in some cases for organizations, we're also training uh, their team, and, and not necessarily that they don't know anything about marketing, but we're giving them a framework uh, and a system so that the entire organization now is talking about marketing in kind of one language, one voice. And that's been really, I think, exciting because I, I personally think businesses need to, to own marketing as an asset and not just uh, abdicate it or delegate it to a, you know, a series of, of consultants. doesn't mean that you don't need strategic help or, or consulting help, uh, but I, I think that that in the long term, as a business grows and evolves, they, they really need to uh, to build marketing as an asset uh, internally. 
No, I, I think it's straight away, and that's a great description. Um, you know, one thing we have a, uh, if you go to Market Muse uh, content marketing maturity model, we have a maturity mm -hmm. model, and one of those components is going effectively from tactics to strategy. Because when you're small, you know, you're just trying to get stuff out the door and put points on the board. And <laughs> being able to have the luxury of having a strategy is something that, you know, most people don't. But also the, 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 the value of a certification and a system that everybody, puts everybody on the same page. You can still right. be creative and have your spin on it. I know we are, we know two of our partners, Vengresso, as well as Value Selling, for example, that we use for social selling as well as for mm -hmm. um, value selling. You know, they you know gave us platforms and frameworks that really put everybody right. on the same playing field and allowed everyone to um, you know really sh shine. Um, and, and, and where we saw, you know, hey, you know, I just thought everybody knew this happens a lot yeah. on marketing teams, I think. And I, you probably see that all the time with these certification. It is. And, and, and I mean, we, you know, we work with uh, what I think are pretty good sized businesses, $50 million businesses. I mean, they have a sales manager, they have a, you know, a marketing manager, they have a, uh, um, a service manager in a lot of cases, and, and actually mm -hmm. just giving them a common language. Um, in many cases, I mean, they don't need us to come in and say, here's how to do social media, but it's, it's right. giving them a strategic framework that they're all talking the same way, they're all using our customer journey um, is really invaluable uh, because in many cases, people just show up with their own tool set, their own toolbox and they go and they go to work. But now having like a common toolbox, I think is, is probably as valuable as anything. I mean, yeah, I think a big status check for every business on today is does your marketing journey, customer journey, yeah. match yeah. your sales pipeline in your CRM? And yeah. guess what? Your answer is going to be no, because almost nobody does. And I know that's yeah. something that you advocate for in spirit. And then I know, you know, uh, another great partner of ours, Pam Didner, who I mentioned on the on the lead. Um, she has a number of books that, that connect to that vision. And I love I love that that's something you're talking about. So first, uh, one thing I wanted to jump in for you is, you know, one thing we think about a lot is, you know, starting with a great site that builds trust for your organization and how important that is, is if what you've got, you know, I always say, make sure the mirror is clear. So that's that yep. first inventory, that first audit, making sure it's not skewed by bias internally, making sure that you get other people's opinions to say, does this, does this speak from expertise? Does this telling that story? And how do you kind of when you're training or how do you think about, you know, that first take and trustworthiness sure. as, you know, being that, that cornerstone for success? Well, really today, you know, regardless of what a business does or how they create a transaction, the hub of marketing is, is your website. I mean, there's just no getting around it. That's, you know, that's the, even if somebody says, oh, you need to hire so-and-so, they're great. You know, here's their phone number. I mean, the first thing we all do is we go check out their website. So, um, it, you know, you have to think today about your websites not being a tactic uh, that, that gets done, but it is really uh, at, risen to the strategic level along with content and along with SEO, I think that, that that's how we have to think about them. And we also have to think, um, I mean, realize that, uh, you know, depending upon what study you read, something like 82% of people visit a website, a brand's website for the first time to do something other than make a purchase or, you know, a conversion. And so we, we have to realize that our websites have a ton of jobs to do. And I like to think about it. And, and I know we're going to get into, you know, my take on the, the customer journey and the stages. I use a little different uh, terminology for the stages, but the, the, the customer journey in many cases starts at the website. I mean, that's where somebody became aware of you uh, as, as you know, in typical sort of funnel language. <clears throat> but a lot of what we're doing is immediately making assessments. We are looking for uh, trust signals. We are looking for value. We are looking for, you know, ease. <laughs> we are looking for, you know, wave on the water and find out, you know, much more or to, or to you know, maybe have, an article or an ebook or a checklist that addresses a, 
a real immediate need that we feel. So we have to think about our websites, particularly the homepage, frankly, um, as, as almost that whole idea of, of a journey. I mean, people may move through a number of stages uh, because they came and visited your homepage for the first time. And um, I think we just have to, we have to think about them, I think, uh, in a much different way uh, because we are trying to sort of logically guide people down those stages of the journey. Um, and and they, again, it may be some time you know, before they ever start considering our solutions, our products uh, to, to actually solve their problem. Uh, but they are certainly um, they are certainly making an evaluation um, from from really you know second one. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And and how do you think about you know I'm always uh, you know a, a, an advocate of stating you know every landing page is mm -hmm. effectively a homepage because that's yeah. a page that may be the first experience with your brand and you may be judging that and every page yeah. you have is a landing page and every landing page is effectively a home page because it's it's where you are making your first assessment you know where you're deciding if you want to dive in and learn more yeah. kind of how do you think about that when you're you know advocating for high quality content um and, and then you know if you think about that kind of extrapolated what what do you tell somebody who doesn't really know their customer like they don't know should i write really expert level content should i write really yeah. easy content but i you know what do you do in those two scenarios well i mean the I'll start with the second part of it. I mean, customer discovery is is customer discovery is something that never ends. I mean, you you, right. um, it it's great if you're getting out there and you've got a new thing and you've made some assumptions about who your customer is. But once you start acquiring customers, you you should have an ongoing process uh, in which you are understanding who they are. You're understanding as much as about you know how they came to a decision. Uh, to be uh, a customer, you need to understand as much about the experience they're having. You know, as a customer. So that's something that 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 we advocate almost on a quarterly basis. That, that you're really mm -hmm. doing um, that kind of research, and it's not scientific research. In some cases, it's it's anecdotal uh, research, but it's what gets to the stories that then allow you to to actually point out, hey, here is the real problem that we solve, you know, for our best customers. So that's got to be right. ongoing, um, and it just needs to be part of your. Uh, your strategic work, but then it obviously needs to flow through to you know all of the content, all of the copywriting that you do um, on landing pages. Um, to your first point, I totally agree. In many cases, somebody you know you think about all of the long tail searches that people do, and they find a, a blog right. post that you wrote five years ago. Um, you know that uh, that in many cases may be their first and only <laughs> um, experience. So you know I'm a real advocate of. Um, you know, of, of putting as many what we call content upgrades uh, to, you know, even uh, random blog posts. So something that's related that's actually going to encourage somebody to say, oh, you're writing about the five best ways to optimize your blog um, or your blog posts. And that's, a, you know, something I'm interested in. Oh, here's the checklist that goes right along mm -hmm. with that. So as many opportunities as you can to kind of personalize and, and you know, heap on value to that random person that came there. But I also, a lot of cases, you know, landing pages in particular, you know, are designed, should be designed to have one purpose in mind and to be as relevant uh, as possible to the reason that somebody got there. So if you, you know, obviously, you know, great example is if you are running uh, Google advertising, for example, you know, that that landing page should be very specific to whatever the message in the ad was and to have that purpose to convert uh, somebody, whatever a conversion is for you, based solely on uh, what that uh, um, ad was all about. So, in in those particular instances, you know, there, there's sometimes a tendency to want to go, oh yeah, but they might also be interested in this and this and this, <laughs> you know, or mm -hmm. we might try to get them to our on our newsletter list because they came here. Mm -hmm. And I think that in some cases you have to resist the urge to want to tell the whole story, uh, particularly in landing pages. Yeah, I think, and you know, we're, we're talk, I want to talk about a little bit more about the journey, but I love the way that you talk about almost as if it is an orchestration across all the content. It's not eating the whole elephant necessarily with yeah. that same that one page. But I always like to also say, you know, the place where they land may not be the perfect fit for them. Is it easy for them to get to the place where it is a perfect fit, whether it's their expertise yeah. level, whether it is their stage, yep. whether they are further yep. along? If you don't get them there, uh, you know you've done a disservice to them and and you. How do you think about, you know, you were talking about, you know, really getting on, getting content at the right 
level of maturity, the right level of expertise, and very mm -hmm. highly mm -hmm. relevant. Um, and that being kind of what drives organic search success. What do you think about how that relates to other channels like social media or reputation management? Um, and how do you use that to influence or create more of a, a feeling of, hey, this is, these are real people. <laughs> this yeah. isn't just an, a, a, a white, white, white box affiliate, right? Yeah. So, you know, the way we really like to think about it is, is to, you know, when it really comes down to it, uh, in the, in the trying to get a customer, customer acquisition phases of, you know, your marketing, there really are two very distinct boxes. Now those boxes mm -hmm. can have 47 little inner boxes as well. But for us, the two boxes are, are, you know, discovery searches or problem solving uh, searches, question asking uh, searches. And then the other one is high intent. So, you know, for example, if somebody types into a search engine, you know, marketing consulting firm near me, they're probably mm -hmm. looking to hire someone. <laughs> but if somebody types into a search engine, why do my competitors rank above me in Google? You know, they're probably just trying to figure out what their problem actually is. And so, right. you know, ver first and foremost, you know, those are those are the two very broad boxes that, that we're always trying to figure out. What are all the problems that we actually solve? Um, and what are the trigger phrases, you know, for those problems? Just as I mentioned, um, you know, if somebody says, why are my customer, you know, why are my competitors always ranking above me in search? You know, the, so it's somebody who is probably looking for an SEO solution, even if they don't know it. Um, and if somebody says, you know, why is the first question, you know, how do I stop competing on price, for example? Well, that's a strategy problem. <laughs> even if right. they aren't looking for strategy solutions yet. Um, and so we fill that box with as many problem solution you know, type of, and, and by solution, I mean our solution. How do we connect that to solving that problem? So we fill that bucket with as many problems as possible, and we're constantly then you know, making our editorial plan around putting that, what some people like to call top of the funnel uh, kind of content out there. But... Um, we also focus as obviously as much attention on figuring out when somebody is trying to solve that problem as somebody realizes, oh, it's a strategy problem. You know, how do we transition them to then trying to figure out, OK, how, how is this going to work for me, you know, with with working with you? And so um, that, you know, in the broadest sense, those are the two buckets of content that we're always producing and always putting out there now. When we execute that, you know, may depend on how somebody comes into, you know, our, our terminology, the hourglass. I mean, if somebody uh, comes into a certain thing, downloads a certain checklist, you know, they might go into a nurture campaign that then is going to start connecting our solution to their problem. Um, but mm -hmm. it, it again, it will you know, somewhat depend on, you know, how they how they are moving, because, you know, one of the tough things is, is we all still want to believe it's a very linear journey. Uh, that people go through, and it's it's just not at all. Um, I mean, it, right. many of the ways in which people come to conclusions, make decisions, uh, the speed at which they do those things are are out of our control. And so, a lot mm -hmm. of times, what we're trying to do is just make sure we're putting enough sort of uh, uh, lanterns, you know, <laughs> along the path, right? Um, it, so that uh, that that people can sort of self guide, because that's in reality that's what's happening today. Um, is a lot of people are, are, it used to be that they would connect with us very early in the journey, no matter what, because the only thing to do was to call up a car dealer and, and start asking them, you know, what the prices were. Um, but, you know, today, a lot of times, you know, people have actually made a decision in some ways, uh, you know, not only about what they want to buy, how they want to buy it, but, you know, where they want to buy it uh, before we even know they, they, they are on the journey. Yeah, and I, I think one comment, and I, I would love to um, actually uh, I think we have the hourglass uh, as a visual as well. But um, the the other piece of this is, you know, it's not linear. And yeah. it's also not a single buyer. Uh, it's not always a single buyer. If you're selling to a team um, that has a decision maker, yeah. you may have encouraged or you may have, you know, struck a chord in the buying journey for someone who does not have purchase authority um and for them you know maybe their boss how are they going forth they're probably going to land in the home page and they're probably going to try to walk themselves to that experience so how are you 
um, creating the experience for other members of buying team. If you're selling to a buying team, how are you creating an experience for different levels of maturity right. or different levels of expertise? And that's a challenge that you know we all face in B two B. It's it's for example, you know, in Market Muse's case, you know, we have someone who has search engine optimization experience. They're like, oh my gosh, this is the best thing ever. It's clearly this. It's clearly that. It does this. It does this. There's no comparison and no replacement value. Uh, but someone who's an editorial person has to have that same experience. Someone who right. owns all of content marketing needs to have that same feeling. And if you're not accounting for those personas and you're not accounting for the fact that they might be at all different stages of the buy cycle or the marketing hourglass, um, you're going to have trouble selling larger uh, priced decisions. And like, for example, even in a car, though, I mean, how many cars have one, you know, one decision maker? Um, yeah. In reality, there's probably almost it's probably like one point five to two. Um, so, yeah. what is the experience you're creating for for that? And, and I thought I'd love to for you to talk through how you think about the marketing hourglass. And one thing I sure. always point out that differentiates you from a lot of buyer journeys and the way that you describe it is you don't stop at the sale post purchase content, and I call it champion development or post sale yep. content or adherence. If you're in pharma, you know post sale content is the most forgotten part of the journey and you've never had, you've never not had it in your material. So yeah, tell us a little bit more about the hourglass. Well, yeah. and, and, and it's also, <clears throat> you know, what's so, so frustrating sometimes when people neglect that is because it's also probably the highest return on investment uh, for, oh, yeah. you know, as, as well by far. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, to, to kind of uh, wrap up your last point too, you know, the challenge with that, as you said, different stakeholders, different buyers is, they also care about different stuff. Um, and that's, you know, that's the tough thing. I, I'll give you an example. We, we had a software company we did work with um, years ago. And we, we, you know, they're real buyer. They, they worked with universities for scheduling software. You know, imagine all mm -hmm. the buildings and the classes and all that stuff. It takes some pretty intense software to get all that to, to work. Mm -hmm. um, and so their buyer in a lot of cases was an operations person who quite frankly, all they cared about was that it worked um, in many cases and, and maybe much more price sensitive uh, you know, as well. Um, and what we discovered in working with them to try to develop you know, messaging and strategy and, and storytelling uh, for uh, their different stakeholders was, you know, in a lot of cases, the, the provost you know, of the university was the ultimate say because they, you know, they, they controlled the budget. Um, but in many cases, those universities were also uh, some of some of their funding was very um, determined by even the state legislatures. So, I mean, you imagine kind of uh, of that, you know, sort of whole you know puzzle, like how do you, you know, how do you, you know, make all of those people happy? Um, and so what we discovered was that this particular software, the analytics that it produced, were so dead on and so um, able to be used proactively as a scheduling, as a planning tool that the, the universities that use their software not only got people to class on time, they graduated their students faster, their tuition was more affordable. So all of a sudden, you know, the operations person is met, the provost is like, wait a minute, you know, that software is not even comparable now to, you know, the other people that are just talking about scheduling. And now all of a sudden you've got a message to take to the state legislature who is now mandating that uh, they're, the schools in their system use the software. So you've got to find, you know, what, what do those people care about? <laughs> um, because that's the problem that you're solving for them. If you can solve graduation rates faster, uh, tuition more affordable, and classes on time, uh, then that's the real key is understanding, you know, the problem that your software solves or your product or service solves for all the stakeholders. I mean, it couldn't be more on the money. Uh, I mean, that is like just, you know, from my standpoint, that's, that's the spirit of, of, of messaging for value. And, you yeah. know, the, the, the difference of, of, of a problem for a middle level stakeholder, those are valuable, but solving a business issue that maybe they don't know that they have is exactly. key. And then those folks, <laughs> yeah. those, and, and you know, that, that's the difference, you know, in, in, in our case, you know, for example, content efficiency. How much content did you create? How much content did you update? How much of it was successful as defined by your whole org, right? And right now, yeah. if you go do that number and you're like 10%, and I'm yeah. like, okay, let's make that 30. And I'm 
being conservative and you're like, oh, right. wow, I never thought that was possible. And then they say, yeah. you know, in our case, it's what's the true cost of content? If only one in 10 of your content items perform, your content actually costs 10x what you think it does. Yeah. So guess what? Yeah. And those are the types of discussions that sell products. And those are the types of discussions that market your offering. It's you got to solve the problem, but you also have to find the issue. And I know that that's really what you were yeah. getting at. And that's beautiful. It yeah. Is. Yeah. yeah. So, so now to jump to the hourglass, which you asked me about. Um, so this is, as, as people can see, um, you know, what, what our customer journey looks like. Um, it's seven uh, behaviors, as I like to call them. Uh, no like, trust, mm -hmm. try, buy, repeat, and, and refer. And I think that, you know, to my earlier point, that a lot of the stages in the journey are out of our control. And this idea that, you know, the old sort of funnel model that's very linear is like put out product, somebody gives your email address, then they get a sales call, and then they, you know, become right. a loyal customer. You know, that, that model just doesn't exist anymore today. And I, you know, I, I talk about it as, as our job as marketers to, is to organize behavior, you know, rather than create demand. And so right. that's why I use what I think are more behavioral terms. And so just to walk people through those pretty quickly, you know, we all, uh, you know, you think about your own buying experience or solving a problem in your own uh, world. You know, we want to come to know, you know, who are the people that can help me? Uh, that's a pretty obvious one. Uh, but, you know, we're constantly making decisions, you know, immediately about we go to somebody's website, it doesn't load quickly or it's it's inconvenient right. to find what I want. I mean, we're making those like decisions, you know, very quickly. And then obviously, if, if we're going to take somebody serious at all, we have to develop we have to develop a level of trust that, you know, other people buy from them. They can prove that other people have gotten the results. You know, they, they they're featured in you know, these magazines or these industry, um, you know, publications. And so, you know, all of those kind of things are part of the decision making process that we want to go through. And then I think increasingly, mm -hmm. we, we all want to be able to try what it's going to be like to work with a business. Now, that might be a a free trial to your software, but let's face it, it might be a phone call to your business. <laughs> you know, that's how people are trying you out um, is, you know, is to see, you know, how does how's this process work when I'm just trying to get a quote or when I'm just trying to, you know, get a question. And then of course, right. you know, the holy grail is we want that buying experience. You know, once we say yes, you know, we immediately go into buyer's remorse, it just to it's just a psychological proven fact. Um, and, right. and a lot of companies, you know, enhance that buyer's remorse, you know, by kind of letting the, the experience uh, fade or not be as as uh, as great as, you know, everything that got us to that point. But then I think from a behavior standpoint, once we find a company that, that exceeds our expectations, I mean, we, we're just we're not going to shop around every time the need comes up. I mean, we're going to go back to them. Uh, we, we, we want that you know, ease. We don't want to have to go through the hassle of finding, you know, a new resource. And then as human uh, beings, I think we're wired <coughs> to refer. Um, and, and in some cases, you know, that's just simply we're wired to talk about, you know, companies that exceed our expectations or that surprise us in some fashion or that, that do something that nobody else is doing in our industry. And so the idea behind this is that, if, if we can if we can understand you know how our customers do come to know about companies like ours uh, what you know they're what's going to make them uh, decide that yes this is a company I want to go further with how do we build trust how do we create a great uh, trial uh, experience in in many fashions you know how do we make the buying experience and the onboarding experience and the the new customer orientation just blow them away you know what are we doing to intentionally focus on uh, repeat. And that's not just a subscription. I mean, that, that, that is, you know, literally right. having something that shows them the value they're getting that, you know, to your earlier point that teaches them, you know, how to use our product service better, that teaches their entire team how to use our product or service better, that, you know, that, that really helps us go deeper, you know, in that organization. And then what are we doing to build champions to, to create um, reasons or opportunities for people to talk about uh, the value I mean, uh, sometimes you, you know, you, you produce, you know, customized content for customers demonstrating to them how valuable this thing they bought has now become for them or this service that we're providing uh, has now come, become for them. You know, that is one of the greatest ways to, to generate referrals, because I think a lot of times, you know, I work with a lot of marketing consultants and they basically say, well, I did what I said I was going to do. You know, look, you're getting phone calls, you're getting results, you know, but we don't have that measurement loop that, that literally says, 
you know, profit is up 41% you know, because of the work that we did with you uh, this quarter. Well, you think that, you know, all, all they're seeing is the invoice <laughs> um, as opposed to that sort of results review. Um, and we're shooting ourselves in the foot if we're not helping customers understand, you know, how valuable uh, the work we are doing is actually for them. They have short memories, customers, sometimes. They have short memories. And, and I think one question, it, it, kind of like getting inspired by something that you said, and we do it almost, it, uh, you know, we're, we're always in progress and in trying to improve this for ourselves. Um, it's, it's an ever-learning process when you have a SaaS offering, but it's to say, is that person a champion yet? And yeah. if you say yeah. yes, why? What were the yeah. things that you told you that they were if they haven't already referred? And and that it's you're going to ask them to be a champion. Um, how how confident are you they're going to say yes and why? If you can answer that why, you can bottle that why and make it objective. And that's really yeah. for us. That was the big difference maker. It was to yep. say yep. like I know the four major data points. Yep. that highlight that this person is likely to answer that question yes and be a viral, uh, you know, and take my K coefficient, if you want to be super nerdy, and make it a multiplier, yeah. right? And and yeah. that's really my, you know, that that's really where you're charged to do things to make those aha moments happen throughout that journey. And I love the way you described that. I, I thought to myself, gosh, I, we need to turn that, we need to re rethink that and, and rebottle it internally so that everybody's like, do everything you can to make that repeat and not just yep. the champion, not just the refer, yep. let's yep. get the repeat right. first, you know, don't get ahead of yourself. <laughs> so, you know? so we've developed something that we, cause you, you talked about the maturity model and I've, I've right. you know, used that same terminology. We have the marketing maturity model because this hourglass is a framework that, yeah. that certainly evolves with the business. And mm -hmm. so, you know, what, what we've actually done is, is created the, the, what we call a customer success track for our customers. And it basically mm -hmm. says, here's the stage they're in. Here are the characteristics of that stage. Here are the problems of that stage. Here are the milestones that we need to say, yes, we did that or no, we didn't do that um, in order to mm -hmm. move them to the next stage. And I think mm -hmm. if, if to, to your point of what you're talking about is, you know, if you can develop that kind of blue, blueprint, that kind of roadmap, you know, you're essentially moving everybody into that champion uh, phase if you can help them be successful. I mean, I think uh, mm -hmm. particularly SaaS offerings, I mean, it, 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 they should treat their customers, uh, they should think about their customers more like members than subscribers. Um, and that, that, you know, the ultimate goal is to get them from where they are to where they want to go rather than to just sell them a product. Yeah, I mean, it's your, if, if you think of them more as members, you're going to focus on their outcomes. You're not going to be focused on their MRR. Right. And it's their That's outcomes right. that matter. Their outcomes, it's, it's you know, you, you may have the coolest, um, you know, the coolest exercise bike equipment and the most amazing <laughs> screens, but it's the, it's the people who feel really good about their outcomes and whether they're, you know, they look great, feel yep. great and, you know, won the race, whether they're going to be coming back next, not just because yeah. you have the uh, L4000, um, yeah. you know, whatever. I just, I just made up a brand, but yeah, that, that's such a great uh, telling comment. Um, yeah. But yeah, tell, tell us a little bit of more, more about how you think about trust with respect to, um, you know, the company's image during this process. Cause I always think about like procurement people, right. Or finance yeah. people who get dragged into the buying journey and, yeah. you know, they are trying to see how big is this company, uh, yeah. which is kind of a mean thing to have to look at, but also do they have a history? What's the experience going to be like, do they have finance people or is this, you know, two people in a garage, yeah. uh, you know, who were, you know, going to do business with, you know, how do you, how do you create the experience or kind of exude your culture and what are the benefits of that from your experience? Yeah. I, I, I mean, the mistake some people try to make is to assume, Oh, well, they have finance people. So we have to look bigger than we are, or, you know, I, be, right. because I think the real objective long-term frankly, because there's going to be people that say, oh, no, they don't seem big enough for us, you know, or we right. like to go with name brands we've heard of. You're never going to solve those people, you know, you, for those people. But if your right. ideal client, your ideal customer is somebody that connects with your true authentic story, your true authentic brand promise, your ethos, your culture, um, then you need to just live that in everything and drive that, you know, through everything. I mean, if you are that small, plucky, 
a company who has some some advantages, who uh, you know likes to treat like you know takes Fridays off because that's part of your culture. I mean, sing it, <laughs> you know, put it put it out there because um, it, the the real goal is you're trying to attract ideal customers, not every customer. And in many cases, I, I mean. It, it can be tough. Somebody sells a twenty nine dollar you know product. You know, it's like, oh, we'll take anybody who's got twenty nine dollars. But if you're going to have a long term relationship, you know, with somebody, particularly in an ongoing repeat referral kind of relationship, it's probably going to be somebody that connects with what you do, that values what you do. That um, and and I think increasingly, uh, you know, I, I'm uh, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, I'm in, I'm actually just turned sixty. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I, I'm a, you know, I'm the tail end of the baby boomers, uh, but these <laughs> next couple generations coming up, you know, uh, very, very much want to connect more with, you know, they don't care about status. They don't care about, you know, how big you are. They, 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 you know, today's buyer cares a lot more about how they connect about what you care about, you know, than, than, you know, trying to be impressed. I'm closer to boomer than zoomer. I think right now, but I, st I still, I take offense to both, frankly. I'm just like, Hey, stop putting me in a box. I'm 41 years old. I see so much, a, sorry, uh, I see so much sorry boomer on Twitter. I just don't get it. <laughs> when, I got when a, got I got a like media you. pitch because <laughs> I, I have Come a on. podcast, of course. And so I get pitched for lots of guests on my podcast. And I got a, a pitch from a software company the other day that said, our software is so easy. Even a boomer could use it. And I thought, you know, who sat around and thought that was a really good <laughs> idea? You know, it may be funny to a certain audience, it may turn off other audiences. You know, it's like, I don't know. You know, it, it, it depends on, you know, I, I would love to see a profile of decision makers in their industry. And uh, and we'll see we'll see we would see where that landed, uh, but anyway, uh, for for just one thing, I uh, we were, we were talking about um, you know the post purchase content. Um, yeah. what, if, if you haven't even thought, so all you knew was awareness, consideration, purchase. If all you knew right. was that early stage awareness, first of all, you know what's the biggest mistake somebody makes in the early stage content. And then also, if you haven't done anything post-sale because you didn't even know you were supposed to, what do you do? Yeah. I love two questions yeah, so the, if you've noticed that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the early, the early stage habit. yeah, the early stage is really um, a matter of, 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 tr of understanding the problems you really solve. That's the, the, that's the yeah. challenge I have for a lot of people. They make a thing, and they know what it does, and it's so great, you know, but, but they – the buyer or the prospect, you know, has it connected that to, to a problem uh, that, right. that their company solves. Um, so that's, that's probably the earliest thing because um, you know, I think when you, you and I were talking, when we were prepping for this, I made the, the comment that the content is the voice of strategy. Um, and, it. you know, instead of just being a tactic, another thing we got to do, it needs to, it needs to drive your entire strategy. So, uh, so a lot of your content decisions should be based on your, you know, your core message, your problem solving uh, core message. So I'll give another sort of analog example, but um, we had a, a, an architect, pretty good size architecture firm that worked with commercial contractors and, you know, their strategy was look at all these letters behind our names. You know, we're, you know, we're brilliant people. Uh, we designed great buildings. That was kind of their marketing messaging and strategy. We went out and talked to their customers and, and their contractors problem was that a lot of times when they would get a big commercial project, uh, they'd have to go out and hire people. They'd have to buy equipment. Mm -hmm. They'd have to get, you know, some, some materials on hold, uh, but they couldn't draw, you know, on the, the loan, you know, for the project until the plans were approved. So the architect mm -hmm. had a lot to do with how they, how soon they got paid. Um, and so, our particular architect was great at getting their plans approved because they had a they did they had a city council person uh, you know on staff they had a couple people on zoning board so they just knew where all the red tape was they knew what the priorities of some of the communities were so their plans got approved faster so mm -hmm. these contractors literally told us like three times in a row you know three interviews we did in a row you know what yeah they do good buildings i mean we figured they would <laughs> you know, but what they really do is they help us get paid faster um, and I was like, holy crud, you wow. know, <laughs> I, I got to figure that out. You know, it's like, and so we turned that into not only their marketing message, you know, on the front end, 
but we basically took this whole feasibility study thing. I mean, we created some of their products and some of their, their try offerings and their repeat offerings based almost solely on that uh, core problem solving message. It became, you know, all the content that we produced on the front end, it became uh, products that we actually produced to enhance that message. And, and that's when I talk about strat, uh, you know, uh, content being the voice of strategy, uh, for many people, it's just a random collection of stuff. Um, and, and that's where you really, really lose the opportunity to, to use it for the power that, that, that it is today. Because I mean, let's face it, it's, it's, it's air you know, for marketing. I mean, it, it was kind of groovy, if, you know, a few years ago to say, uh, you know, content is king, but I mean, it's air. <laughs> it powers, you know, every channel has to have it, you know, sales, marketing service, you know, has to have uh, content, but, but, but it has to be strategic in nature. Yeah, I think the time, you know, the, the fun part is, you know, folks like you and, and, and me, we were talking about content quality before it was, you know, something that people thought you needed. And now, Content quality gets you in the door and building a great story yeah. puts you through the window. And, you yeah. know, the, the, the big thing I see now and um, Elias, uh, one of our uh, one of our guests at the webinar, today, he pointed out that he's working on storytelling courses. Um, yeah. And this is really helpful for him to sell those story. And I mean, I'm a huge fan of a lot of uh, your methodologies for storytelling and how you can weave those in. How do you take, you know, how do you take that seriously, you know, uh, into, you know, creating aha moments and, you know, and all those different types of kind of storytelling devices? Well, again, you know, if you understand the problems that you're solving for your customers, I mean, this, what the story allows you to do is, um, and, and I'm, you know, I'll take it a step further and, and hopefully I won't have to do too much to distinguish these things. Yes, you have to have a story, but you also have to understand the narrative. Um, and, and to give you a quick example of that, you know, you think about the movie that starts with the fiery car chase that, you know, that that's like the starting scene. Um, the car blows up you know, the, the, the hero of the story was in the car and you're like, wait, you know, that was the beginning of the movie. And then immediately they like flash to the heroes in sixth grade, you know, and a teacher's mm -hmm. getting on them about, you know, and so the story, you know, is, well, you have this problem and you solve it this way. And, you know, wouldn't the world be great if, you know, the story, if we just limit to that is, is kind of linear, but understanding those story chunks, about mm -hmm. the problem that that person's facing, about the fact that it's not their fault, <laughs> you know, that here's what's going on in the world that's causing that problem for you. You know, here's what your world could look like. So we have to develop those chunks, but we have to also understand the best and most potent way to rearrange those chunks in a narrative that, that creates the greatest impact. Um, and that's the part where, um, you know, your person taking these storytelling, I mean, I would, I would tell everybody, take screenwriting. Um, yes. uh, classes because because that is an art that that you know a, a, a well-told narrative makes a story so much more impactful I was looking behind me for some of my storytelling or my storytelling books as well as my screenwriting books but yeah. oh yeah the screenwriter Bible I mean there's so many in, out there that um, are must reads I mean it, it gets right. you to you know finding the big beginning of your story by examining how it ends I mean I think that's Matthew Dix but like yeah. Uh, which is a great book, you know, story worthy if you haven't read it. Um, but yeah, I mean, you you can't understand this whole story until you know how it's going to end, and you can't build that narrative in you know creatively and really succinctly and put it into the chunks that are going to resonate until you have that power. And I mean, you described it so well. It's just like you know, you're you knowing the problem. The mm -hmm. problem isn't the story. You know, that's, that, right. that's what I think a lot of people fall into. It's like, I know this, I know the business issue. That's how yep. you maybe might sell on a sales call, but that's not the story, you know? That's so, right. That's yeah. like the, the, the whole idea of that kind of narrative is, is you get sucked in, you know? And, and mm -hmm. it's like, well, now I got to know the story. <laughs> how does this end? I want to know how this ends. You know, <laughs> it's not about, you know, I like the selling versus installing is, is, is kind of like the gross way of saying it. Um, but yeah, you know, yeah, they, yeah. I want to, you know, I want to know how this ends and I want to know what the story is for how they think it's going to end or how I might think it's going to end, you know, and when you can put that aspirational model next to real results, then you win every time. And that's really yeah. the, the big, big, big finding. I love, I love that. 
Um, yeah. So what else, you know, am I missing about kind of the small business marketing system, the marketing hourglass that would pertain to somebody like, you know, battling for budget? And I, you know, that's what yeah. I always, I'm always thinking about someone who it, maybe it's a one to three persons in the marketing yeah. org and, you know, they've got a set budget and they want to, you know, they want to put points on the board this ha first half or this quarter yeah. so that they can ask for more money for content or more money for paid. You know, like w yeah. what are the things that you do, you know, for a team in that boat? Because I think a lot of people are there and we don't often recognize it. So, Well, the, the place for the quickest win in most of the organizations I've worked with over the year, it, years is let's go look at the customer experience. It's from the, the, the day they say yes to, I don't mm -hmm. know, let's pick an arbitrary number, 90 days later. How can yep. we how can we totally upend what we're doing there? Because we're probably not doing much anyway. Um, and so, mm -hmm. you know, how can we create an amazing onboarding experience? You know, how could mm -hmm. we create an orientation process? How could we surprise somebody in the first 30 days? And, mm -hmm. and the good news is some of that stuff's not really that expensive. Um, but mm -hmm. it's where I think you can get the quickest wins, particularly when it comes to content. I mean, we all know that you know part of the challenge with content is, you know, it might take six months to start winning in the SEO game, you know, or it, it might take a, a, a while for somebody to go through your sales cycle if it's a you know purely a you know content-driven uh, sales cycle. But for people that are already coming in the door to just blow them away, focus on ways that you could do things that are different, do things that they didn't expect, do things that surprise them. In many cases, that can pay very quick dividends, certainly in terms of, of you know, them sharing and, and, you know, them all of a sudden, you know, creating, you know, the, the, the holy grail of user generated content, you know, where they're showing mm -hmm. a picture of, of, you know, the, the note they got, you know, from the customer service person saying, you know, this is amazing. Nobody does this. I mean, that in many cases I find is, is the place to get the quickest win. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I will also say from a budget standpoint, you know, having that public stuff out there is, you know, is a great, even if it hasn't turned into, you know, 12% increase in, uh, in, you know, revenue this month, you've got some tangible things to say, look, customers, people, you know, are sharing this. People like this. I mean, so I think those, to me, that's always the quickest win. I mean, you drop me into any organization and say, how could you get us the quickest win? That's where I'd start. I agree completely. I think showing them that you know them, you know, show them you know them as a kind of a trite way of saying it, but also, you know, recognizing that the customer journey that we're looking at here, the marketing hourglass, the customer journey, it doesn't always happen only on your site. And, mm -hmm. you know, especially in, you know, there's a place, there's one to N places where almost everyone will absolutely take one to N detours throughout this process. It might be an internal process. It might be social proof. It might be user generated content. And if you don't think people are going to those places, it might be their own Slack communities, like our content yep. strategy collective, which we're doing an AMA in, in a few next few minutes yep. and go sign up for it. Like that plug. Uh, but it, it could be a place where, where you, you've got to figure out where they are. And if you are putting blinders on and not managing those experiences, I think managing those external experiences is a quick win for every org. And that's both reputation management, but also optimizing the yeah. cycle uh, for yeah. sure. So, yeah. Well, um, I, I, what are the one things other... that, you, you said B2B. Do you often look at like a G2 and a software advice and those types of sites and Captera? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, industry, uh, I mean, there's no question that reviews, you know, every industry reviews, testimonials, case studies have, all, have become increasingly important, uh, you know, trust building data points. Uh, but uh, I, I would also say that from a social media standpoint, you know, one of the one of the I think the most missed opportunities, you obviously we all see firms out there that are doing a great job with it, but is is to share culture in social media. I think that's probably more important than trying to share, you know, business objectives is to, you know, when the founder brings in their new baby to the office, you know, that I uh, guarantee you will get a whole lot more engagement in social media than uh, some new feature set that you release. Now, I think that that's a huge missed opportunity. And, you know, it's I think it's something that you often put on the back burner or a second priority. Um, and, you know, it's it's knowing it's not about how many people are there. It's knowing that the people there aren't miserable or right. they're not jerks. 
I mean, yeah. I mean, just blatantly, they're not jerks. They're not, you know, you're sitting in a in a in a on a boiler room, you know, cutting right. each other's Achilles heels. You know, they're they're actually good people doing great things, and they're normal. They're like you and me, you know. And that's yeah. where you know, I, I think that a lot of businesses, especially in the marketing space, you've got the haves and the have-nots. You've got you know, so you got to really, really fight the ego. Um, and, and, you know, personal brand doesn't mean ego. And that's really, I think, a big <laughs> differentiator for a lot of businesses in our space. And I think you kind of set the standard for that um, with duct tape marketing. So um, we're about to wrap. We've got a, a, a few a few questions, but any, any other sentiment before we jump into? Um, and I'd love to know a little bit more about kind of any additional resources, please join us for the AMA. Sure. Um, any resources or offers you've got pending? Any plugs you want to throw out there? So, well, the the, the one thing that we could do a whole show on um, that I did uh, 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 did want to really at least throw out there for consideration is you know we didn't even talk about uh, employee branding and you know content right. to actually attract talent because. I mean, let's face it, there are a lot of industries that that's a real challenge, right? Certainly in IT, um, I work with a lot of uh, folks in the construction industries and, and they, they just finding talent yeah. now is tough. And so, you know, would you rather go work at a company that's talking about how big they are? Or would you rather go work at a company where people actually seem like they like, like each other? So, you know, that's, uh, um, you know, that that's a become, I think, a, a you know, a real key point in, in, in the whole content space as well. But, but again, we could we could do a whole show on that. Um, so the, you asked me about uh, a couple of resources, and I, I see you have them up on the screen now. There are, uh, depending upon where, what flavor of world that you are in, um, we have an ebook that's uh, free to download called "The Seven Steps to Small Business Marketing." It is really for small business uh, owner. At least it's, uh, frankly, it's good for anybody, but it's directed more at the small business owner. And then, as you talked about, we have a, um, a network of independent marketing consultants who actually license and use our methodology, but. but more than that, there's about 150 um, uh, companies in that uh, network, and, and frankly, we, we collaborate, and it's it's almost like an association of people, you know, using a similar framework. Um, and so, if you're if you're a coach, consultant, professional services at all, um, then we we have a book that's called Seven Steps. To, to grow your practice without adding overhead. It's listed there as the no overhead ebook uh, for uh, consultants and, and coaches and agencies. So those are a couple uh, free resources that I'd point you to at uh, Duct Tape Marketing uh, as well. Go to Duct Tape Marketing. Go listen to the podcast. Absolutely. They've got so much information on there. Um, and, you know, all the resources are linked in the resource box on the On24 console. Uh, please join us in the AMA. Um, also, and what I'll, what I'll also mention, you know, a personal, a personal plug, if you want to know what those aha moments are for a market muse user, reach out to me, Jeffrey underscore coil on Twitter or Jeff at marketmuse.com, And I'll tell you what those are. And those are the things that if you do them in the first 30 days of working with us, uh, you will be a champion. Um, and we are very confident with that because if there's one thing we do best and John will uh, is, is use data to make great decisions. And that's what we want for for you as you're making these great decisions. And I love the the duct tape marketing, small business marketing system. I mean, put that on your wall. Just print it out, put it on your wall. Make sure you've got all those buckets covered um, and you're going to have a lot of success. So thank you so much, John, uh, for joining us today. This has been so much fun. Um, and, and, and it's great to finally connect on one of our p podcasts not just yours and yeah. also just hear about you know you know get into the deep dive of, of how you advise teams of all sizes um and and really truly uh separate you know things like problems from business issues and and, and how true that has been for you know so long um but very very important today uh i'll give you a last word thanks for joining us well, thank you all uh, for, for tuning in. And, uh, you know, as uh, Jeff said, uh, duct tape marketing or just uh, feel free to, to if you've got any questions or things you want to discuss, it's john at ducttapemarketing.com.